First and Second Thessalonians, preparing for the second coming. This is uh, lesson number six. I want you to open your Bibles to First Thessalonians chapter five. We're going to try to finish out this one uh, in this lesson today. So one of the things that Paul describes in this particular epistle is that the true church has certain characteristics. Very interesting, the ones that he mentioned. Uh, very interesting for the ones that he doesn't mention. You know, the true church, you know, he's going to talk about the true church and what he doesn't make any mention of is the size of the church, the age of the church, how wealthy it is, how big or small a building they have, how much money they have, how many elders, they, they, not at all. Not, I'm not saying those things are not part of the package of what makes a, a church you know, successful and so on and so forth, but the things that he mentions a true church is true because uh, it has experienced a true conversion at the hands of true and sincere ministers. And we talked about that in the last couple of weeks. Also, the true church was growing. An indication of a sincere true church is the fact that it's growing in moral purity and the knowledge of God's word. And as far as our, you know, our epistle, the, the book that we're studying, specifically what would actually happen when Jesus returned. So he's, he's writing to them, this, this young church that he's only spent a month with uh, to establish. He's kind of filling in the blanks for them. They've asked questions about what's going to happen at the end of when Jesus returns. And so he spent a little time. Uh, in our last lesson I explained that although many things are happening at the end of the world, remember we said when Jesus comes a lot of things are going to take place. Uh, you know, the dead in Christ will rise, the Christians will, will meet them in the air, the wicked will be judged, Satan will be condemned and destroyed, if you wish, uh, bound forever, uh, heavens and earth will disappear, the new heavens and the earth will be created. All these things are taking place in the twinkling of an eye. And so what Paul does is he doesn't talk about all the things that are taking place, he focuses in only on what is going to happen to Christians at that moment. So I explained to you, uh, it's dangerous to try to you know, pick each one of the things that happen at the end of the world and try to make a timeline out of that, especially a timeline based on human time. All right? So um, he says, of course, essentially, if it's going to happen this way, if it's going to be in the twinkling of an eye, then you need to be ready for that. So if these things are so, Paul explains not only that they have to be ready, but how they can be ready. How to prepare for the second coming of Christ. And in chapter five, he offers eight different things individuals need to do in order to be ready. So let's, uh, uh, let's uh, read that. First thing he says, um, watch yourself. <laughs> you want to be ready for Christ and His return? Watch yourself. So he says in verse four and five, but you brethren are not in darkness that the day would overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. So he says Christians are the light. In other words, that's another way of saying they see what's coming. He said, I've just explained to you what's going to happen at the end of the world. You know what's going to happen. You know it's coming. So you're not in darkness. You're not in ignorance you know what's going to happen. You're, you're in light. Uh, unlike the unbelievers who are not even aware that their end is near. They're in the dark. So he talks about watchfulness. In verse 6 he says, here we go, so then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. Two words, alert, pay attention, he said. Be alert, pay attention. Be watching and sober, sober rather, meaning uh, clear-minded, clear-minded and peaceful. Verse seven and eight, let's keep reading. He says, for those who sleep do their sleeping at night and those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. So he's talking about sobriety. He's, our sobriety is spiritual in nature and it distinguishes itself in that we live by faith and love for others and firm hope that Jesus 
will come. Interesting thing when he talks about sobriety here. You know, we don't allow ourselves to be led away. The opposite of sobriety is to be led away, inebriated. And he's not just talking, he mentions you know, drunkenness you know, with alcohol, but the word sobriety is a much broader word than that. We're not inebriated by the sin of the world. We're not inebriated by faithlessness, uh, by heart hardedness, loss of hope, so on and so forth. He said that, that's spiritual drunkenness. People who are inebriated spiritually are people who have lost hope, who, who don't have their faith anymore, you know, that they've been led away. And you, know, you, can, you can apply that word you know, to alcohol. You can be led away by alcohol. In other words, it, inebriates, it, it, it inebriates you, it, it clouds your, your judgment, and so on and so forth. We all know that. So what they're saying is, be, what Paul is saying is, be careful not to be inebriated by the things of the world, to be led away from your faith, to be led away from being, paying attention to what's going on, uh, to be faithful uh, until the end. In the same thought, we're still talking about you know, the number one way to be ready, and that is to watch yourself. So he, he keeps going, verse nine and 10, he says, for God has not destined us for wrath but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with Him. So he encourages them to be watchful against spiritual laziness and sin because they are destined for eternal life with Jesus, not punishment, and they need to keep alert so they won't lose their way. Isn't that the message we give our children many times? You know, especially as they grow older and they're you know, in high school, you know, leave, getting ready to leave home. Isn't that the encouragement we get, we get them? Hey, you, you've had a good start. You know, don't lose your way. You have a great future ahead of you. Isn't that the thing that we're all hoping for our children? You know, that they, they won't mess up their future by impulsive, foolish mistakes when they're young because they're immature and they, you know, they haven't cultivated you know, a lot of self-control yet and so on and so forth. I mean, uh, parents are on their knees a lot, you know, asking God, please you know, guide my child, help my child avoid the pitfalls, and so on and so forth. It's exactly what Paul is saying to this young church. They're like adolescents, this church. And he's saying, you people have been destined for something so good, you can't even imagine what's waiting for you. Don't throw it away, don't be inebriated, don't be led away by the things that are kind of pulling at you in this world. You know, People lose their way most of the time, spiritually, um, because they're careless. It's not, you know, nobody goes out and like one day wakes up and says, you know, today I believe I'll go into prostitution. I think that'll be good, that'll be a nice, nobody does that, I mean, really. Or I'm going to go out and rob, or I'm going to embezzle my company, or I'm going to you know, do some awful you know, big S sin. You know, nobody does that. It's gradual. We compromise, we, we get lazy, we get careless, you know, and so on and so forth, and slowly but sure. That's why that word led away is so appropriate. We, we slowly get led away from our commitment in our faith, almost to the point that it's imperceptible. You know? It's only by looking back to where we were at. And I tell people the best way to measure your spirituality, just look back a year or two, where were you there? Where were you in your prayer life? Where were you in your service life? Where were you in your personal holiness life? Where were you in your sexual purity life? You know, where were you two years ago? And in comparison to now, has there been any, have you gone, you know, have you been led away? Still a firm commitment? So that's what he's saying to them. Be careful, watch, pay attention to what's going on. Pay attention to what's going on. You know, I've told our children all the time, even as adults, it's always about faith, Paul, Julia, it's always about faith. Every day, the, the, the game is not money or success. We're living in this world and we, we, we have to you know, live in the world. But what it's about is how is the world affecting your faith? That's what it's about. It's always about that, all right? All right, so number two. So number one, he says, be watchful. Number two, he says, build up the church. Imagine that. 
How, how can you be ready for the sure return of Jesus? Build up the church, he says. In verse, put it in his words, verse 11. He says, therefore encourage one another and build one another up just as you also are doing. Again, two key words that describe our ministry one to another in the church. First word, encourage. Uh, in other words, some of your Bibles may have comfort or exhort. The word means um, uh, to call to one side, to bring someone to one side. You know, uh, sometimes we have, uh, well not sometimes, all the times we have people that come to the church, have mo mobility issues, right? We see them with a walker or a cane or limping, you know, like Dave, you know, dragging his hip around, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, <laughs> And, and, and what, what's the instinct, right? They, they, we see them hobbling up the stairs. If you're nearby, you go to the door, right? You open the door or you, you come alongside of them. How are you, you know, perhaps to just help them negotiate some of the turns and the steps, right? That's the word that he uses here. It's the same word used by Jesus in John 16, 7 in referring to the Holy Spirit. It means to call to one side. The idea is to support someone else in weakness by coming to their side, coming to their aid. Encourage one another, he says. And then the other word is build one another up. The original Greek word simply meant to build a house. Just build a house. Uh, some of your Bibles might have the word edify. Promoting spiritual growth in another person. And this is done, of course, by teaching and example, encouragement, patiently, uh, given to those who need such things. Every time you say to some, every time you're listening to someone and how's it going and they're saying, well, you know, my wife has been very ill and we've been to the hospital and so on and so forth, you know, and you, respond, you listen and you respond, say, well, you know what, I'll, I'll remember her in my prayers. You're building up that person because you're saying to that brother, uh, I am going to be thinking about you in spiritual terms. Now you may, you're not the doctor, you can't operate on her, and you know, you're not the nurses, you can't do that, and so on and so forth. But there are, there's a building up spiritually of that person that can take place. Note that Paul says that the individual members are to comfort and edify each other. He doesn't say the preacher is supposed to do this for the entire church. <laughs> it's okay if you've got a church of 20. Even I've preached for a church of 20, and believe me, even that's a lot of work. But when you get to a church of 400, it's impossible. I mean, it, it, most of you don't know what it's like being in the office. Well, Sarah does, she's in the office. A couple of you, you know, uh, Laura's uh, I worked in the office. If you only knew how many prayer requests and how many hospitalizations and tests and stuff, I mean, you couldn't get to all of it. I mean, you couldn't get to all of it. That's why Paul doesn't say, all right, you, you ministers, make sure you, you go see everybody and take care of everybody. That's not what he says. He says, brothers and sisters, you need to take care of each other. Of each other. Because that's, that's how the church grows. A lot of times people are angry, disappointed in one of the elders or one of the preachers because they didn't show up at a certain thing. Don't realize that the the, the way to grow the church spiritually is to have members, and that's not, a, that's not eliminating elders and ministers and their work, but the way to build the church up is when the church is ministering to itself. That's a mature, that's a mature church. So um, our activity in the church either builds the church or tears it down. Paul says that a ready Christian is one the Lord finds building the church when He, when he appears. And he emphasizes the idea that this is the work of everybody in the church. When the Lord comes, will He find us you know, building one another up or tearing one another down? Boy, you know, the last thing I want to happen to me is that I'm complaining about one of the elders when the Lord comes. <laughs> I don't want to be caught doing that. Of course, I never do that, but you know what I'm saying? Or talking trash about a member or, you know, I, or about anybody. I'd much rather be found on the day that he comes or the night that he comes, you know, much rather be found building up the church than tearing it down in some way. That's another way to be ready. That's going on offense. That's going on offense spiritually. Number three, watch yourself, build up the church. Number three, respect your leaders. Verse 12 and 13, let's read that. 
He says, but we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. So Paul refers to the work of the leaders and the attitude that the church should have towards them. So of course, the leaders fulfill their ministries if they are working hard. Notice the Greek word there is diligent work. It's actually the word for toil. You know, you, know, you, you ever say to your kids, well, if you don't go to school, boy, you'll be doing pick and shovel work. That, my mom used to say that, you know, pick and shovel. Because back in the day, you know, my ancestors, you know, Italian people, when they came to America or Canada, that's the only kind of job that they could get. You know, pick and shovel. Literally working on construction or for the city, pick, shovel, pick and shovel, digging ditches and holes and stuff like that. And that was the thing. If you don't go to school, you'll be doing you know, pick and shovel work. Well, that word in the Greek here is pick and shovel work. Toil. The leaders are working, they're working hard in their roles. They're serving, not just making decisions. Yeah, leaders have to make decisions, but that's not all they do. They're teaching, not just talking. They're training, not just supervising. The problem with the leadership sometimes is, is, is when people become leaders, they think, well, I don't have to work anymore. All I have to do is supervise other people working, but that's not the way it works in the, in the church. It doesn't work like that in the military, I guess. You know, the officers that are most esteemed, I guess, are the ones that really are there with their, with their soldiers, with their people. It's the same thing, every company. People in companies really appreciate the leaders, the managers, supervisor who are down on the floor with their people. They understand what's going on. They're ready to work with them and so on and so forth. Same thing, same thing in the church. So the church, he says, needs to recognize that this is the work that leaders are doing and ought to appreciate them for doing it because it is being done for them. I mean, our elders don't get paid. We, we know that. Some, in some places, maybe one elder or two get paid because they're doing something specific, you know, whatever. but most of the time, elders don't get paid. Who says they had to take on all the extra hours of calling, visiting, up early to go see somebody at the hospital, up late talking to somebody on the phone, extra meetings on Sunday afternoons and so on. Who said they had to do that? They're not doing it for themselves. There's no recognition, no pay benefits. There's no, quote, perks like in a company, you know, if, you, if you go up the ladder for leadership, you get perks. You get a bigger office, maybe get a company car, or, you know, you get perks. There are no perks for church leadership. There are spiritual ones, but you know what I'm saying. You take on leadership in the church, what it means to you and your family is that you work harder than everybody else. You give more than everybody else. Your time is more at the disposal of the church than everybody else, but I'm saying, who says that has to be? Why them and not you? So Paul is saying, hey, recognize that those who lead are doing it for the love of the church. Not for any type of gain. There is no physical gain. So the best way to encourage leaders in the church is to love them, of course, and to cooperate with them. So I go back to the you know, serving, teaching, training. That's their task. So how do we, we serve by their side? We obey the teaching if it is biblical. We accept the training with enthusiasm. So a church is not only ready for the return of its Lord if it is, uh, excuse me, a church is not ready for the return of the Lord if it's complaining and not cooperating with its leaders. And the leaders are not ready for the Lord's return if they're not working hard in their ministries. Again, I, I, I don't want to be you know, moaning and groaning and complaining against my leaders when the Lord comes. I'd much rather be found working alongside them supporting them, praying for them. That's the proper attitude uh, to be ready. All right, number four. Again, watch yourself, build up the church, respect your leaders for, be at peace with one another. Be at peace with one another. Verse 13, he says, live in peace with one another. We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. So Paul states the objective 
and then the method. So the objective is be at peace with one another. Okay, how do you do that? A, admonish the unruly. In other words, warn the troublemakers. <laughs> you want peace? You have 400 people, in those 400 people there's always one or two that just, they just like to make trouble. So he says, you want peace? Warn the troublemakers. In Thessalonica, these were the ones who did not work and they caused trouble in the church. We, we learn about that later on. You want to be at peace? Encourage the faint-hearted. Um, another word, those who are discouraged. Uh, encourage them with what? Well, encourage them not to give up. Not to give up. The strong in the faith are to encourage those who are weak in the faith. Don't give up, it's worth it. And a lot of times we don't do that with a sermon or do that with a, you know, a verbal exhortation. People watch what we do. You're going through a difficult time, whatever it is, illness, loss of work or whatever. You know, you're going through a difficult time and people are watching how you handle that. And that you handle that in a faithful way, maintaining your good cheer, maintaining your love for the Lord. You know? that inspires others. You know, it's the old story, if they can do it, I, I can do it. Third one, help the weak. Here the weak is not weak physically, although it includes that, but it's the weak who are weak to temptation. Hold on to those who are easily drawn away from the truth. Easily drawn away because of impurity or excessive whatever. You know? Some people have a weakness for a certain thing and maybe we know about that. We need to help them. We shouldn't be afraid. You know, I, I, I've not been afraid to ask somebody, so how's, how's it going in your struggle with fill in the blank? If they've confided in me, I'll follow up and say, so how's that, how's that thing happening? What's going on? Whatever it is, you know, just fill in the blank. You know? They say, well, you know, it's been a good week. You know? And I say, well, do you need to talk? No, I'm still hanging in there. All right, I'm going to pray for you, specifically. I'm going to pray for you. Help, help, the, help the weak. Next one, he says, be patient with everyone. Be ready to bear under all people who you come in contact with. Our two children who were in the military helped me understand with the idea of bear under, maintaining one's bearing. I remember Julia, she, she, she meritori meritoriously was promoted one time and uh, you know, some of the brass was there, you know, for, she wasn't the only one, there were others. You know, they give out their bars or pins or stripes or whatever it is. And on that particular day they permitted the parents who were in attendance to present you know, the, the, the rank, you know, the upgraded rank to their child. <laughs> and Julia said to me, now dad, this is not a time to fool around. <laughs> we don't need you making a joke here, you know what I'm saying? I said, no, oh, don't worry about it, you know, and I had her going. And uh, she maintained her bearing. She didn't smile, she didn't cry, she, nothing. You know? This was a moment where she had to maintain her bearing. That was perhaps an easy one, but Paul, when he was in the Marines, used to say, there are, you just have to, we were standing at attention, it's 45 minutes, it's 102 degrees, you know what I'm saying? And see, we're still, we're maintaining. Well, it's the same thing. Maintaining our bearing. What is our bearing as Christians? Well, we're maintaining our attitude of love and kindness patience, forbearance, long-suffering, we're maintaining that bearing despite the provocations that we might be under from different individuals. And then of course, he says, return good for evil. Return good for evil, that's the Christian reaction. Those who offend us, we offer the other cheek, not the fist. Uh, a proverb that I have had to learn by heart, Proverb 19.11, not much for memory work, but this one I have committed to memory, 
It is to a man's glory to overlook a transgression. I have had to repeat that to myself over and over and over again in the last 35 years of ministry. It is to a man's glory to overlook a transgression or an offense. Because many times you want justice, fairness, payback, that's not fair, I didn't deserve that, blah, 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 you know. Return good for evil. Remember, what's the goal here? Well, the goal is maintaining the peace within the body. And maintaining the peace within the body requires more than just you talking or me teaching it. Most of the times, it requires us to admonish the troublemakers, encourage those who are faint-hearted and weak, be patient with things that are going on. You might know better, and it might be your expertise, but you're not in charge of the thing. Has that ever happened to you? <laughs> you know, somebody else is in charge and they're doing it and you're watching and saying, oof, boy, just, just let me in there just for a day and I'll fix it. You know? You're not in charge. The elders have put so-and-so in charge. Be patient. And then returning good for evil. When, when, the, when there are disputes in the church, it is because we violate one of these principles here. We cannot be happy when Jesus returns if He finds us divided and at war with one another or ignoring one another's spiritual, spiritual needs. Again, I don't want to be at odds with a brother or sister when the Lord returns. Number five, how to get ready. Watch yourself, build up the church, respect your leaders, be at peace with one another, Rejoice always, verse 16, rejoice always. Rejoice always. Seems like an impossible thing considering the hardships of life, but Paul is writing with a view of the return of Jesus, remember. Regardless of our circumstances, we can always rejoice because nothing can change the fact that Jesus will return and when He does, we will be with Him. How happy I will be if the Lord returns and finds me rejoicing. I guess the best moment for His return would be in the middle of a song at church service. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that be kind of, you know, we're singing praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Da, 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 da. We're, we're singing it full-throated, you know, standing, and the Lord returns. That, 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 that would be good. That would be a good moment, I think. I, I don't, if I had to choose, I guess, that's the moment. I would choose. So rejoice always, not because everything is always going smoothly. I mean, I'm looking around the room and I can almost, you know, I can tell a lot of stories on all the people in this room. There are moments where, where's, what? I have no reason to rejoice. My child is sick. My life is upside down. I've lost my, you know, I have no. Paul is saying, in view of the end, you always have a reason to rejoice in view of the end. Number six, he says, another memory verse, rejoice always, Pray always, verse 17 and 18, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. What is God's will? That you be praying. Nothing is too small for you to pray about. I've mentioned before my wife, I used to leave. She's always praying for parking spots. <laughs> you know, I'm thinking, ah, you know, in my mind I'm saying, that doesn't work, don't bother the Lord. Oh, there's one right next to the door. You know, she does that every time. You know? And I think God finds them for her just to mess with me. You know? I mean, oh dear. A Christian isn't always praying, obviously. We've got to sleep. But we can always pray if we want to. Because there's some nights I can't sleep. And believe me, when I can't sleep, instead of tossing and turning, I get up to pray. I, mean, I just get up and pray. Why? Because the reasons for giving thanks are endless. You don't believe me? Okay, you want to start praying. Dear God, I'm so thankful that I can blink. Because if I couldn't blink, it would be a difficult life. I'm thankful that my eyes see. Lord, I'm thankful that my nose actually can distinguish various smells. And I'm glad my nose is not all plugged up like other people who have allergies. Right, Bob? Oh, well, yeah. yeah. 
Lord, I'm happy that I don't have uh, always chapped lips, because I know people who have to have a stick with them all the time, because their lips are always chapped, and my lips are not chapped. Do you get the idea here? If I knew more anatomy, I mean, I'd never get away from the human body. So why pray without ceasing? Because there's, an, there's endless reasons to, to give thanks, and God wants you to do that. It's also His will that we pray. And Jesus is always present as we pray and as mediator. And the Holy Spirit is always there to help us. If we don't pray always, it's because we're too busy doing other stuff. So a ready church is a church with an open communication line with God through prayer. Again, another good time the Lord could come for me personally is in the middle of one of my prayers. 2 a.m., can't sleep, sitting up in the dark, praying, praying for you many times, just pull out the church directory and start at A and work my way through. Because I know pretty much all the families and I know a lot about each family. Wouldn't it be great if the Lord came and that's what you were doing in the middle of giving thanks for your food or praying for your children? Number seven, he says, Rejoice always, pray always, study the word. Verse 19 to 21. Do not quench the spirit, he says. Do not despise prophetic utterance, utterances, but examine everything carefully, hold fast to that which is good. Paul teaches them how to respond to those teaching them the word through the gift of prophetic utterance. In other words, they didn't have the Bible in those days, uh, individuals had the gift of being able to speak God's word authentically, clearly, exactly. They had that gift. We don't need that gift now because we have God's word. We have, it, we have it in completion. Everybody has access to it. You don't have to have the gift of prophetic utterance to have access to God's word. You just have to have one of these. And today, in our day and age, these are available for very little money in any language that you choose, almost in any, 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 uh, any style. So they are to listen, he says, not to ignore these prophets or not to ignore the word, but they're to test or examine carefully what they say and hold on to what is good, meaning the good teaching, hold on to that. So today, as I say, we don't have prophets, we have the Bible, but the admonition is the same. We are to be doers of the word, not just hearers. Hear the word, put it into your heart, do it. Jesus said that when He returns, it will not be the ones who say, Lord, Lord, who will enter into the kingdom, but those who do the will of the Father. There are a lot of religious people in the world, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they will enter into heaven. And then the last thing He says, be pure. Be pure, verse 22. He says, abstain from every form of evil. This was my favorite passage as our children were growing up and wanting to do all kinds of things that there wasn't something specific in the Bible. <laughs> what does it say in the Bible? You can't go to a nightclub. <laughs> oh, you want to go to a dark smoky place where they serve alcohol? Okay. <laughs> you, the Christian, this is where you want to go? Well, show me. And I'd go to 1 Thessalonians, abstain from every form of evil. Oh, dad, no fair, you're using the word. <laughs> <laughs> Notice that Paul says every form of evil. This not only includes like moral evil, you know, adultery, drunkenness, dishonesty, all that stuff, but also spiritual evil, such as false religions and human philosophies that deny God. Every form of evil. I go back to, where does it say? It doesn't say, thou shalt not go to the casino. <laughs> no, it doesn't say that. You want to go to a place that specializes in gambling and prostitution, where perhaps a, a mob money is involved? This is what you want to do? This is where you want to go? This is the place that you want to be seen at? Really? Oh, nobody here does that. That's why I'm saying this to this crowd. Every form of evil. Ask yourself, if the Lord came, would He want to find me here? at this movie, watching this thing, taking part in this activity. Is this where I want the Lord to find me when He comes? When a bride prepares for her wedding, 
she does not go out on a date the night before or begin cleaning out the garage. She wants to remain devoted and clean for her future husband. It's hair and makeup, you know, and the hair and makeup usually take longer than the actual wedding ceremony, in my experience. Well, the church is the bride of Christ and is ready for His coming if she is completely devoted only to Him and remains pure. It's not meant to be an exhaustive list, here are the eight, but if you do these to prepare, they will lead you to other good, good works. All right, we've got five minutes left. Why? Why do we need to be ready? 23 to 24, now may the God of peace Himself sanctify you entirely and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is He who calls you and He also will bring it to pass. Why do we need to be ready? Because God promises that He will do, he will do His part. And His part is to completely perfect us. You know another thing that happens in the twinkling of an eye? You know, I said the Christians are raised and all that stuff. Another thing that happens is that we are perfected. The thing that we hungered and thirsted for all of our lives as Christians that, were, that was out of reach for us, we're perfected, finally, no sin. No sin, no more imperfection in the twinkling of an eye. In this passage, Paul says, why should I you know, be ready? Because when the Lord comes, the things that we wanted, He'll finally give to us. We need to get ready because there's a great day coming and it will come because God Himself has promised it. And I ask you, which of His promises has He ever broken? Yeah, none. And then another question, why teach? Why am I teaching this? Paul says, brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I adjure you by the Lord to have this letter read to the brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So he finishes up his first letter with a salutation and a request for prayers and a blessing. He also commits them to reading his epistle to the church so that everybody would be ready should Jesus come in their lifetime. So you know what he says here, this is what I've done. I've read this epistle to you and given you as much as I can anyways, details and explanation concerning this particular information. All right, so when you leave, if you remember anything about this lesson, I want you to be, remember one thing. One day, you and I are actually going to see Jesus Christ. We're going to see Him. So when you're discouraged or saddened or suffering because you're lonely or sick or you don't have enough time or money or talent or whatever or you're failing to accomplish something, all that you ought and all that you want to do, just remember that in one brief moment it will all be over and you will actually see the one that you prayed to and trusted for your eternal life. If that's true, then watch yourselves, build one another up, Respect your leaders, be at peace with one another, rejoice and pray always, study carefully the word and remain pure as you can be so that you will be ready when He comes for you. And please note that He will come for you and for me. It's the reason why we're here today. All right, so next time we're going to jump into 2 Thessalonians, and there's some interesting stuff in there. The man of lawlessness. Who is the man of lawlessness? And how, how, do we, how will we know him? And all that good stuff. So we'll see you next time. Thank you.